Okay, so I have a I have a selfish reason to be here in front of you, and the selfish reason is that the best way to learn is to teach, and so what I'm really trying to do here is teach myself. So thank you for trying to educate me. It's it's great. I haven't made this presentation before, so it's relatively new, and I'm still trying to figure out some of the bells and whistles, and I actually don't have all the answers. So I think I'm, I'm hoping I get more clarity as we go on. And some of you might have seen Yellowstone, you know, the series. Who's seen Yellowstone? Well, we've got a few Yellowstone fans. I think I was watching the, what is it, the 1889 or something, the second. 1883, right, the second one. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're heading west, and, and there's one particular scene when the Native Americans are, are attacking, and then they, they say, you know, circle the wagons, right? I mean, there's a, you, might, you guys might not remember that, but there's a particular point in which they actually circle the wagons. And circle the wagons actually is a term that comes from the 19th century, and we had these large wagon trails going west, you know, claiming land and conquering the frontier, if you will. And when the Native Americans attacked, the best defensive posture was to put the wagons in a circle and then try to defend as best as you can with that configuration. And I thought that that analogy might be a good way to think about investing in terms of circling the wagon. So I'll, I'll just go through a few slides and then we'll go through what you guys want to talk about. So this year in Buffett's letter, he had a couple of very candid and great quotes. You know, he said, over the years I've made many mistakes and our extensive collection of businesses consists of a few enterprises that have truly extraordinary economics, many that enjoy very good economic characteristics and a large group that are marginal. You know, so actually if you look at the, the 80 plus acquisitions that Berkshire has done, Warren and Charlie probably themselves would acknowledge that probably at least half are outright mistakes. And this is, you know, the, the best practitioners of the art. And then he goes on to say, you know, in 58 years of Berkshire management, most of my capital allocation decisions have been no better than so-so. And our satisfactory results have been the product of about a dozen truly great decisions, and which he's saying is about once every five years. So I tried to basically look at this period from like 65 to 22. And so, you know, you have, let's say, 80 acquisitions in this 58 year period. He probably bought at least 210 stocks. I use 210 for my convenience so I get to a round number, <laughs> you know. I like to work with round numbers, but it's probably a larger number than 210. And his key hires, I'm, I'm expecting that in the last 58 years, he had at least 10 key hires, you know, which were very important to Berkshire. So if you look at these decisions, there's about 300 important decisions. And he's saying that 12 move the needle. And so basically it ends up being something like 4%. And we have 4% from the, like the gods of investing, which is, uh, doesn't, doesn't give us a lot of confidence. <laughs> and I took a stab at what the 12 businesses might be, or the 12 decisions might be. One of them I, we know is Ajit, so we put his picture up there. Because you know, they've always pointed out that the single best decision they made was the search fee they paid to hire Ajit Jain. And uh, there's a guy who used to, I think theoretically still works at Berkshire, Michael Goldberg. And Michael Goldberg, I think now must be in his 80s. And Michael Goldberg was the guy who hired Ajit. And he hasn't really been active in Berkshire for probably more than 20 years. So Warren's kept him on the payroll. And every year he gets a million dollars from Berkshire. And if he lived to a one, to, till 150, they would keep paying him the million <laughs> because it's still a great deal. So if you look at the other candidates, you know, Geico is probably one of those, and then Coke, Amex, C's, Apple, BNSF, Mid-American, National Indemnity, Gillette, 
Washington Post and then Cap City, the ABC. I mean, I think it might be that one or two of these might be off and Warren or Charlie might say, well, you got maybe 90% or 80%, but most of it are directionally correct. That these, were the, these were the large or the most important decisions that happened over almost 60 years. And what was really important, if you go back to these decisions, the important thing was not that they bought these 12 or they hired a Jeet. The important thing was they kept them all. So it, it wasn't the buy that was, because they had, you know, 288 mediocre to poor decisions. They kept those two, right? So basically, in effect, they kept all 300. They lived with all 300 decisions. And it was really important for these 12 not to be, have been deleted or sold. So basically, when we look at this kind of statistic, what we find is that investing is a very forgiving business. And, but it is forgiving if you don't cut the flowers and you don't water the weeds. You know, so the, the difficulty comes when you start cutting flowers and watering weeds. But we see this pattern. So when we go and look at his record, you know, with just a dozen decisions, the, you know, it's just completely, he's completely trounced the S&P. So even with this 4% great decisions, they are like, you know, at almost 4 million percent in annual returns. And basically, the S&P is just a very small fraction of that. And I want to go over a few other examples because I want to show that it wasn't that Warren and Charlie were anomalies here. I think Warren and Charlie are more kind of par for the course in terms of how things work. So many of you may be familiar, there's a South African company called Naspers, and Naspers used to be a newspaper publisher. And they've been around for about 100 years. And in 19, I think 1999 or 1998, they brought in a hired gun CEO, Koos Becker. And when they brought in... Uh, Coos Becker, basically at that time, Naspers had a $500 million market cap. And Coos in 2001 took $32 million of that and bought an obscure Chinese company called Tencent. And he got a 46% stake, 46.5% stake in Tencent for the $32 million. And in fact, interestingly, they, he, they bought the stake from Li Ka-shing who's a billionaire in Hong Kong, who's a very savvy investor. So it actually was a private transaction with Li ka selling, who was probably you know, kicking himself for selling. And if we look at what happened, so Naspers has a $500 million market value. In 2004, when Tencent went public, the, market, the value of Tencent was about $900 million at the IPO. And so the Naspers share was almost like north of 400 million, which would have been most of the value of the company. You know, the company was about 500 million. It was now approaching like half the value. They sold a little bit of a few shares at the IPO, but they pretty much did nothing after that. So from 2004 to 2018, they never sold a single share of Tencent. And, and, and if you look at it in 2018, Tencent has a market cap of 530 billion. So it went from 900 million, 10 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion, and they're not touching it. At, at this point, you know, when Tencent is a $100 billion market cap, it's like 99% of the value of Naspers is sitting in Tencent. You know, it's basically almost the whole thing. And it's sitting in a company that they do not control. And it's sitting in a company that is in China. And through all of that, Koos Becker doesn't sell. And amazingly, the family, because he's not from the family, the, the family with the hired gun lets the hired gun do what he wants. And I just want to give you a story about Koos Becker when, when he was being hired. So he told the family, I do not want a salary please make my salary zero. I also don't want any bonus. Please make my bonus zero. 
and and he said all i want is whatever value creation occurs <laughs> on my watch just 6% of that <laughs> comes to me and the family said where do we sign <laughs> right and so it was a great win win for both sides right i mean i mean everybody won and to their credit even when it got to 100 billion or 200 billion of uh, 10 cent market cap they just they sat there and i think the reason they had the comfort to sit there was that Koos Becker was on the board and he had a chance to spend a lot of time with Pony Ma, the founder of Tencent, who is a very unusual, uh, probably one of the best entrepreneurs we've ever had in the history of entrepreneurship. So they kept, anyway, so even in 2018, when it was a $170 billion value, and they started to, in 2018, to, to close the gap between the NASPERS NAV and the, and the look-through value, they started to sell. But even, even today, basically, you know, they've, for the most part, held the position. And it's like a 50% compounded over, like, you know, 20-plus years. And, again, the important thing was not that they invested in Tencent, you know, because they invested in many other things. The important thing was that they didn't touch it. And, and even today, in 2023, NASPERS is the largest shareholder of Tencent. And on a per share basis, so if you look at each NASPERS or process share, their look through ownership of Tencent has only gone up. So even as they sold, the look through ownership per share has gone up because they've done buybacks. And again, the circling the wagons around Tencent was really key. Then we have Rakesh Junjunwala from India. Some of you may know him. And he passed away last year, unfortunately. He was only 62. And Rakesh was an exceptional investor, but he never managed money for others. He only managed money for his own account. And until maybe a year or two before his death, he really never started any businesses. So it was all the wealth was created organically from his investing. And he started with $400 when he was 25 years old. And when he passed away, it was $5.8 billion. And uh, which was a tremendous, you know, 56% compounded over 36, uh, 37 years. Uh, in 2003, Rakesh bought 5.9% of a company in India called Titan Industries, which has a brand called Tanishk. And Tanishk is basically a jewelry and fashion retailer. So he owned 5.9%. And then by 2011, he had increased his stake in tightened to 11%. The second 6% or so that he bought, or 5% that he bought, he paid almost 20 times what he paid for the first 6%, which is psychologically really hard for us to do. You know, we investors get to anchoring. You know, I bought something at $10. I'm not going to pay 200 for the same thing. You know, but he amazingly kept adding to his, his Titan position at higher and higher prices. And uh, basically, that's very difficult to do psychologically. And when he passed away, you know, so he sold some as he went along and so on. But we passed away. He still owned 5.2% of Titan, valued at $1.4 I'm excluding all dividends. There were some pretty significant dividends over the years. So the, basically, the $3.7 million became more than $1.4 billion. And if everything else had gone to zero after 2003 for him, he would still be $400 to $1.4 billion. It would still have been a tremendous record. And the amazing thing about Titan is that it's still firing on all cylinders. And it's actually, even today, in my opinion, still embryonic in its, in its growth and development. It's a remarkable, amazing company. And it's been a great journey for Rakesh and his wife, who now looks after the portfolio. I'd be really surprised if she trimmed Titan. You know, I think, I think she probably understands it better than he did. And uh, most of you are probably familiar with Nick Sleep. You know, Nick Sleep's a good friend of mine. And he ran the Nomad Partnership for about 13 years with his friend, uh, Case Zakaria. And, you know, when they, when they shut down the fund in 2014, it had about $3 billion under management at the time. And I remember one of Nick's LPs calling me at that time in a very panicked mode. 
And uh, this was a very large university endowment. And so they're saying, oh, you know, Nick is returning our money. And we don't want the money. We want him to keep running it. And I, I told them, I said, he told you what to do. He told you to take the money and just put it in three stocks equally. Amazon, Costco, and Berkshire. So now he's telling you that you don't need to pay me any fees anymore. And you just buy these three stocks and you don't touch it for 10 years. So he says, yeah, but we can't do that. I said, why can't you do that? He says, we're not allowed to buy stocks. I said, change the mandate. <laughs> but this is the way the world functions, you know. They, they were so distressed and they never bought these companies. And Amazon was, I think, about before, before the split, it was the one fifteenth of the price it is today. I mean, it, just, it just was a radical change. And uh, anyway, what, what Nick and Zach did for their own portfolio is they allocated a third each to these three companies. And then Amazon became 70% of his portfolio, which he was getting uncomfortable with. So he sold half to buy a digital retailer. You know, retail is terrible. <laughs> it's not good. So ASOS has not done well. But I don't think Nick is suffering. <laughs> you know, he's OK. And basic, I, I met him, I think, last October. So he still has the one-third Amazon, which keeps going. And so that's worked out very well. So you know, in 2004, they had put 20% of their portfolio into Amazon when they were running the fund. And a number of his investors exited at that time because they thought it was too concentrated. And they said, oh, we are very uncomfortable with this concentration. So they, they left the fund. Then later, when it became about 33% or something, even more left because they were really uncomfortable with the, with the whole situation. But if, if, he has, if everything else in his portfolio had gone to zero in 2004, they would have still beaten the S&P by six percentage points with just the 20% in Amazon alone. So Nick and Zach had many, many mistakes along the way. Many investments they made did not work, but it didn't matter. You know, you, in their case, you could have been wrong 80% of the time, and it didn't matter, and it still worked out, worked out very well. And uh, it's really funny, just to go back, so Nick, you know, they still have their office in London, and they've given part of the office to some um, friends of theirs who basically, I think they run a commodities fund, which had not done well. And Nick was always telling them, can you just put like 5% of the fund in Amazon? And they said, we're not allowed to do that. And so they keep suffering, and that's the way the world works. And so then we have Ben Graham. And you know, Ben Graham is very famous for net-net investing and you know, deep value and so on. But in 1948, he bought half of Geico. And he bought half of Geico for... 712,000. And Ben's you know, cornerstone of the Grammian approach to investing was that you buy things well below liquidation value and, and definitely well below intrinsic value. And as it gets, when he starts approaching those valuations, you sell them. You know, and then you go back and find something else. He never applied that to Geico. He applied that to all his other stocks. He never applied it to Geico. And so when he passes away in 76, that 712,000 is 95 million excluding dividends. And he never wrote about it. So all the Ben Graham books mm -hmm. never talk about the fact that the biggest success came from buying a great business. It did not come from all the you know, great mathematical games of you know, net net investing and all of that. And the other thing is that he would be very diversified, but he put 25% of the portfolio into Geico. And basically, if everything else again had gone to zero, he would have still been done twice the S&P, you know, 12.9% versus 6.9%. And like I said, it was, it's never been mentioned, you know. And when he passed away, it was more than half of his net worth. 
And then, you know, we look at this concept, the late 60s and early 70s, some of you may remember the Nifty 50. So the idea at that time was that there were these 50 great businesses, you know, blue chip companies in the U.S., and you should you would invest in all 50 of them, like 2% into each one, and valuations didn't matter. It didn't matter what price they were at. So these were like McDonald's and Coke and P&G and Polaroid and Xerox and all of these companies. And uh, there is some controversy whether Walmart was part of the Nifty 50 or not part of the Nifty 50. So we'll consider both cases. If you consider the case that Walmart was part of the Nifty 50, it, Walmart went public in 1970, and you assume that Walmart is 2% of the Nifty 50 in 1970, and the other 98% goes to zero, you know, it just all of it, 98% error rate, you would have compounded at 13% versus 107 for the S&P. So with, you know, 98% error rate where they've gone to zero, where you only left with one stock, which was 2%, you significantly beat the S&P and basically just highlights how some of these ama amazing decisions can work out. Now, if we take the other case, which is that there's no Walmart in the Nifty 50. So in 1972, just before the great crash of 73, 74, you know, these companies were trading at crazy numbers. You know, Xerox was at 49 times trailing earnings, Avon was 65, Polaroid was 91 times trailing earnings. And, you know, Xerox fell 71% in the next two years, and Avon fell 86%, Polaroid fell 91%, and eventually they all went to zero. You know, they, they, they disappeared eventually. And the Nifty 50 as a group lost half its value in that 73, 74 period. And so if you look at these high flyers in, the, in 1972, you see really high PEs for like McDonald's and Disney and so on. But even if you, even if you bought the Nifty 50 in 1972 at those absolutely peak valuations without Walmart in the picture, from then till now is 10.2% annualized. It's just 0.1% a year below the S&P. So even with no price discipline, and even with a lot of zeros, and even with no outlier like Walmart, you almost go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the S&P. And it still works out. But the reality is, when the Nifty 50 dropped 50% in 73, 74, by 1975, no one was in the Nifty 50. You know, they had all moved on, you know, badly bruised and so on. And again, staying with it would have still worked out quite well. And then we have the example of Coke. So in, in 1988, amazingly, Berkshire put a quarter of its book value into Coca-Cola, 25%, company they didn't control. And from 88 to 98, they had a, just a spectacular, you know, 32% annualized return. And Coke in 98 was trading at a nosebleed valuation. It was trading like the Nifty 50 was. It was and, you know, in the meetings in 1999 and in 2000, Warren couldn't praise the company enough. You know, there was such a great company. And then if you look at it from 98 till today, it's been just 4%. A year. It's been positive, but it's just 4%. And actually, it went through a long period of time where it was just flat and actually declined quite a bit. And Warren mentioned that in hindsight, he should have sold Coke in maybe the 99, 2000, because it was really difficult to justify that valuation. And, but even, even when you take the suboptimal decision of not selling Coke, at this really high multiple. When we look at it over the entire period, we're still ahead of the index. You know, it's 12% versus 10.5%. And this is one of the things that is a, is a dilemma for me that I'm still trying to, trying to figure out is basically what happened with, you know, whether the Coke decision to keep it or not keep it, which way is it, 
is it better? So there's some key lessons uh, that I've been able to figure out. The first key lesson is the error rate is going to be huge. <laughs> so if we have Warren and Charlie having these big errors, you know, mere models like us, you know, we're just going to have a big error rate. The second is don't cut the flowers and don't water the weeds. And hold on, if it's a great business, hold on to it for dear life. Third lesson is do not pay fancy prices for great businesses. So if you look at all these examples of Titan and Coke and Amex and Geico and Amazon, Tencent, Ajit Jain and so on, you know, Warren shares about Ajit that every year when he pays him his bonus, he thinks he left a zero off. <laughs> you know, he said, I, I, and you know, between us girls, now that Ajit is part of the board and all of that, we get to look at his comp. And him and, I think last time I looked was like 20 odd million for him and, and Greg Abel. So, you know, the Louis leaving the zero off, you know, should be close to 200 million, but you know, that's okay, Ajit is still happy. And, and then, you know, we focus on the great businesses with great people and long runways. And actually last night, I had dinner with Chuck Acre, who's a wonderful guy. You know, Chuck, uh, some of you might have heard of Chuck. So Chuck lives in a town in Virginia called Middleburg, which has one traffic light. And uh, I was really interested in seeing this one traffic light <laughs> town. Because, you know, when you hold these great businesses, you have nothing to do, you know. So I wrote a letter to Chuck. I didn't know him, you know. And I said, dear Chuck, you know, I really want to see the one traffic light. <laughs> and uh, would it be okay for me to visit, you know, and you can show me the traffic light and so on. <laughs> and amazingly, he responded. He said, yeah, we'll go take a look at the traffic light together. <laughs> and, and I made a very nice trip to rural Virginia last, last I think, November. Great weather. It was a great, very nice drive. And uh, so he has, Chuck has this concept of the three-legged stool. And I went with, when I went to his office, there were a number of three-legged stools in the conference room. And so they've like, you know, really made sure that they never forget about the three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool is usually used for milking cows. And one of the things, you know, chairs should really not have four legs. If you don't want a chair to wobble, it needs to have three legs. So it was really stupid whoever came up with the four-legged chair. And if you look at all the furniture that Frank Lloyd Wright created, the chairs are all three legs, you know, and you don't have the wobbles. It's great. And uh, so the three-legged stool that Chuck has is number one is he wants to invest in businesses which are run by people with the very highest integrity and who have skin in the game. So they've, they've got an ownership in the business and their you know, integrity and abilities are unquestioned. So he doesn't ever want to compromise on the human aspect. The second is that it must have very high returns on equity, on invested capital, with an ability to reinvest at that high rate for a very long period of time. And so we want the great integrity, we want the high return on invested capital, and the third is a very long runway. And so he said that when we have these three elements, we're done, you know. And uh, so I was listening to a podcast the other day, and someone was talking about, he was talking to Chuck Akery, and he was telling Chuck Akery, Chuck, so Chuck's number one position is American Tower. You know, they've done extremely well with American Tower. It's a great business. And uh, he, he tells Chuck, uh, Chuck, I found the next American Tower. And Chuck says to him, son, the next American Tower is American Tower. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in a way that only Chuck could say it. So I'm not going to cut the flowers there. And so, you know, compounding is the eighth wonder of the world, which Einstein tells us. And if you really look at, you know, the magic of compounding, there are three elements that come in, right, when you're looking at compounding. Your starting capital, your annualized rate of return, and the length of the runway. And there's an interplay between these three factors. So, for example, 
if I have a 7% return a year, applying the rule of 72, it'll take 10 years for my money to double. If I have a 10% return, rate of return, again applying the same rule of 72, it'll take seven years. So basically you can switch and change one variable for the other. And so if you're, if you're interested in the final outcome being a really large number, it could be a really large number by starting with a large number and having a short runway and even a small annualized rate. Or it could be you start with a really small number and some kind of a rate of return and then the runway. So, you know, whenever Warren is asked, you know, some genie comes to you, offers you one wish, Warren, what would you like? And Warren's answer always is, I want it to be such that when I die and they look at my corpse, they say, man, he was old. <laughs> and he doesn't want to live long because he likes to hang out with us. You know, he wants to compound for as long as possible. So that, that runway needs to be as long as possible. And so Warren really understood. Warren was actually 56 years old when he became a billionaire. So if you, and if he had not given money away to the Gates Foundation, et cetera, it would be like 230 or 240 billion, be the wealthiest guy on the, on the planet. So even when you look at the, the journey over the last, you know, 30 odd years for him, maybe 35 years, it's like 99% of his wealth has come in the last three decades. So the interplay is really important. And one of the things that we have the most control over, we have the most control over the length of the runway. When we invest, we may not be able to you know, precisely tell how well the company does, but we have the runway for sure. So some other lessons, you know, do not sell when things appear fully priced. So great businesses have a way to surprise on the upset. But when things are egregiously priced, selling may make sense. And when you figure out the difference between overpriced and egregiously overpriced, call me collect. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, this is where you know, it gets confusing. You know, at what point do we flip from overpriced to egregiously overpriced? And a single great business, if we apply this math and methodology, could become 60%, 70%, even 99% of the portfolio, like we saw with NASPERS. And I think NASPERS had conviction because Tencel itself is very diversified in their income streams. And Berkshire, you know, Buffett's had 99% of his wealth for a long time, itself is very diversified. And, but when we get to non-diversified fact uh, companies, so when I started my fund, the very first investment I made, July 1st, 99, the first day of the fund, was Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> Some of you might have heard of it. <laughs> Some obscure bank in California, you know. And uh, at the time, I was interested in Silicon Valley Bank because Anytime they made a loan or they got a client, you know, in Silicon Valley, if you're a masseuse at Google, you get stock options. <laughs> Everybody gets stock options. Your server at the, at the restaurant gets stock options. So when the bank would make a loan to their Silicon Valley clients, they will always get warrants. You know, they would collect the interest. They always get some warrants. And at that time in 99, they were sitting on this huge basket of warrants with no disclosure, except that we have a lot of warrants. And I realized that the bank was trading at that time slightly above book with no valuation given to all the warrants that they had. And all these companies at that time were going public. And so I was, I was able to see that there's a bubble, but I was trying to find a way to play the bubble with upside with no downside. And I said, Silicon Valley Bank is the perfect way to play this because it's not in the price. So if all those warrants are worthless, we still have a decent bank 
or what we thought was a decent bank. And so about a year later, it had gone up like 150% because they started to monetize. And then in their quarterly earnings, what was happening is the monetization of the warrants was dwarfing their banking income. It was, there was so much coming out. And in a moment of brilliance in 2000, I sold Silicon Valley Bank and said, well done, Monish. You know, this worked exactly like you wanted. In a year, you more than doubled your money. And then I watched for the next 23 years, they compounded at 25% a year. You know, because actually it was a tremendous franchise. Even today, in many ways, it's a monopoly in terms of the, you know, they're really good at understanding the, the needs of the tech business. But, but then, you know, we come to the 23rd year and it goes to zero. You know, so any number multiplied by zero is zero, no matter how big that number is. So this makes it really hard that, you know, if I was very enlightened and I said, no, this is a great bank with a great franchise and I had just kept it, there would have been very few warning signs in, I mean, some people saw it where their book value was upside down and so on and so forth, but maybe the answer there is you keep it to 50% or something. And then I have a real world situation, you know, this is why we get to the core of the matter why I'm here. You know, the core of the matter is I need to learn. You know, not teach, I need to learn. So one of my funds, the Pabra Investment Fund 3, which is an offshore fund, has about 200 million assets. There's a company in Turkey called Resas, which makes up 40% of this fund. I didn't invest 80 million in Resas. I invested single digit millions in it. It just went up a lot. And there are two, two other butts that are about 30% together. So if we look at the fund, 70%, about 140 million out of the 200 million is three bets, right? And Resas has already been a 10-bagger, but it's still cheap. It's not even fairly priced. It's actually probably today sitting at something like one-third of what its liquidation value is. And so if Resas went to its full liquidation value, it would be 250 million in the fund that today has a value of 200 million. And it would become like close to 70% of the pie. So I love the business. We see all these lessons. And what am I supposed to do? And I have no idea, you know? <laughs> I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. But these are happy problems. You know, they're not sad problems, they're happy problems. And uh, I'm hoping at some point I will get enlightened on some good answer on how this should be handled. So far, I don't have a very good answer, but we'll try to figure it out. And that's pretty much the song and dance. So thank you very much. So you had a question. Oh, you've given up on that question. It was such a beautiful question. But now that it's chopped liver, let's go to the next question. Well, you get to pick either one. But um, those three, the many companies you talked, this was a fa fantastic presentation. Thank oh, thank you. Very you. Much. Uh, you talked about Titan, uh, Rakesh and Yuan, amazing. Uh, Tencent, Amazon, Walmart. Um, it looks like uh, it comes down to Pony Ma, Sam Walton, Jeff Bezos. How many of them are there, really? I mean of those type of people. It looks like it comes down really to those guys, I mean, executing. And so it seems like it's extremely important to find those people. Actually, you're right. It comes down to them. But we don't need to identify them up front. So, you know, we do well with a 98% error rate. As long as we have Pony with 30 other yo-yos <laughs> in the portfolio, we're OK. And we don't know which of the 30 is Pony Ma? But over time, we will know that. So I, I think it's, it would be, you know, the, the funny thing is that I was in, uh, in Turkey a few, few weeks ago. And I've now owned Resas for four years. And something that always puzzled me was they repeatedly enter kind of brand new businesses in which they have no competence. And in a few years, they're number one in the country in that business. So they, they, from a standing start, they go into these areas where they have no expertise. 
and they, you know, it just, and I couldn't understand. I said, is everyone else idiots? Like, what's <laughs> going on here, you know? And I, I realized, this is the first time when I met the guy, I realized that he's the energizer of money. So he probably gets like 72 hours of work done in 24 hours. And I never saw that trait in the last several meetings and interactions. I mean, I could see it in the numbers that they were, they, they hardly ever failed and they were able to enter these things and they were able to do all that. But I, I could never really, and what I realized is that Warren has made the same statement about Greg Abel. You know, recently I think he was talking and he said, you know, I just see what gets done in a day with Greg and it would take me like, you know, three or four days to do those things. So the, the thing is that I, my, my perspective is that I don't think we can tell in advance. I mean, I think very few of us have, would have the gifts to look at somebody. But I think what, what you can tell easily is after the fact. And, and so obviously when we are going into a business, when we're investing in a business, we have to look at the historic trend marks. And we, do, we can look at the numbers, we can look at return on invested capital, we can look at a few metrics which would point us to businesses that are likely to be great businesses. I think after that, separating the wheat from the chaff will happen automatically as we get to, we, we only get to know a business after it drops about 40% in our portfolio. That's when you really get to know the business. And so the same thing with the companies we invest in. I think we may have a idea about these businesses, but we really will get to know them far, far better after we've owned them for a few years. So I would say that basically as much as we, would, we might like to try to have a portfolio filled. Now think about a portfolio at Walmart and Amazon and Costco and Tencent all together. Never happened. You know, that might be superhuman capability. We haven't seen that happen with any investor so far. And we've even seen with Warren and Charlie with incredible temperaments and incredible brain power and really good at the art, still a lot of errors. So I think the, the best way to answer that is to accept that we'll make the errors, but to really study what we've got. And uh, I, can, I can point to many investments I made in the past where the buy decision was exceptional and the sell decision was horrible. And uh, you know, it's happened so many times and, and I know it'll keep happening. So I'm trying to you know, make amends. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how do you differentiate when you're so concentrated? Let's say it's 50% of your portfolio. How do you, do you differentiate between just normal business problems or like things that come up and uh, the complete and the opposite of complete stagnation? For example, the IBM, they completely stagnated since 20 years, but before they were a great business. Or GE is, well, it nearly died. So how do you differentiate between there? Because that's very hard then. Like Charlie says, why should it be easy to get rich? <laughs> you know, and but but these are difficult. I mean, I agree with you. I think that separating the signal from the noise is not easy. But I would say that you should err on the side of patience. So business are, businesses are going to go through cyclicalities. They're going to go through ups and downs. Some things will work. Some things won't work. And so you need enough time to be able to tell that and yeah so the the risk is we will not be able to sell optimally but the risk is even greater if you're too trigger happy so yeah go ahead thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, i've been a big fan and i've been following your work um, interesting thing about this presentation is i think it's quite paradoxical from what i mean many other great investors have also spoken about i remember like uh, reading one of your very old uh, write-ups or one of your presentations where you met uh, Charlie Munger and asked him if he still advocates buy and hold approach or like let's say if he was running a smaller pool of capital would he still buy and hold forever sort of things and I think the sort of answer that Charlie gave which which I recall is he said if I was, if I was running a smaller pool I would do something which I was doing during my partnership days buy something which is at a discount when it goes to a full value sell it and then do it all over again only problem is at this point of time, we are at this situation where our size is so large, we cannot do this anymore effectively uh, on a very large scale basis. So on a smaller scale, probably that makes much more sense than doing something like buy and hold forever. But where we are talking about like today is the circling the wagons, 
I mean, this is something which is very different and very opposite to what that sort of a th thought is. So what are your thoughts? On well, I would say what you're describing is more Warren than Charlie. Yes. Okay. So I think this was more Warren's approach. And Charlie did similar things, but I think Charlie was much quicker between the two of them to understand that you really want to get into the great businesses. So one of the interesting things about investing is we have like 50,000 stocks around the world. If you said that I only want to buy businesses at a PE of 1, you can find those. If you said PE of 0.1, you would find those too. So pretty much, you know, you could set whatever criteria you want. And because the, the pool is so large, as long as you're willing to dig in, you would find all those things. What I realized recently is, you know, my favorite place to visit is Turkey. I wonder why, you know, <laughs> but I really enjoy my time there. And what I realized is that I get to invest at Grammian prices in Munger-esque businesses. What could be more orgasmic than that? <laughs> that you buy at Grammian prices and then you, it's actually a monger business. And so the, the thing that made it really easy in Turkey, I think, was that the business qualities were so high and then the prices were so low. And so the dilemma will come later, like I described, you know, but those are good problems. Yeah, at the back there? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, thanks for taking our questions. I have one question, uh, what do you think about U.S. debt level and U.S. dollar as a reserve currency and how do you factor that for next 10 years in your investing style? This is your thought. So far outside my circle of competence. <laughs> 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 so I will duck that question because I have nothing intelligent to say about it. You go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, at the risk of being turned down because I'm, I'm not sure if you still hold this position, Please uh, talk us through the story uh, and the lessons learned from, from uh, Seritage. Oh, Seritage, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the logic and idea there was that we had this large amount of prime real estate all over the place, some not so prime. And uh, depending on how these different, I mean, I think Seritage is a, is a case where it's kind of an 80-20 rule or maybe it's a 90-10 rule where, you know, 10% or 5% of the properties have most of the value. So uh, the bet was that the liquidation values, et cetera, were significantly above where the stock was. So the stock used to be in the 30s, and then suddenly it was $6. And uh, it appeared that the $6, $7 price was too low. In hindsight, when we look at what everything's happened so far, especially now with rising interest rates, et cetera, and a lot of distress in real estate, probably the $30-odd price would be too optimistic. So my, my best conclusion on Seritage is that there's no need to circle the wagons. We can let it go. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So first of all, thank you for all your teachings. A little louder. Thanks for all your teachings. Like, I feel like coming here is the dakshina to you. I can't afford a 600,000 dinner yet. But uh, <laughs> uh, my question is, you mentioned multiple times that we have an age between our teenage years, 11 to 19, where uh, we develop a, and specialize, or primarily optimal to so specialize in. You were lucky enough to specialize in business during that time. What would you tell the other mortals who didn't get that education and still want to pursue a finance or a business type field? Well, I think, I think if at, as parents we are aware of the fact that the human brain is set up optimally to specialize between, let's say, 11 and 20. And the, the traditional education system in especially the 11 to 18 time window makes you a jack of all trades, right? It's, it's, not, it's not set up to make you specialize. But, but the kids and the parents can do things outside of school, extracurricular different things to hone in. So, I would say that there should be more of a more of an education to parents to try to understand you know what might possibly be the aptitudes and leanings and interests of their kids as they're getting 10, 11, 12 years old and to see if it's possible to increase 
time in those endeavors and those areas. So I think basically with Warren and with Bill Gates, et cetera, it happened outside the school system, right? I mean, they were, they, they were going through a jack-of-all-trades school system, but they were able to specialize as teenagers. And uh, so it's possible, but I think you need kind of a team around you to help you do that. And I think that's, unfortunately, it's not well known. I mean, most parents just assume the school system will take care of things. So, but you are aware. And so you guys can uh, do that for your kids, which is great. Yeah, behind you, yeah, right there. So, I'm Radek, and I'm 16. And my question is sort of similar, but uh, the idea when you want like a long runway, um, how do you figure out like parts of businesses that you're like, better analyzing at? So how do you start developing your circle of confidence? And, because I think you need a really strong like circle of confidence. You need to know your boundaries um, as you start. So how do you how do you start developing your boundaries, and how do you know um, like I should stay in certain spots at like around this age? Yeah, so the good news is that we can do very well with very narrow circles of competence. We don't need to have large circles of competence. The initial starting point of things that we are likely to understand are things that we consume. So the products we buy and the services we, we buy or use. So I would limit us, you know, so for example, you might be might have an apple phone you know you might buy levi's jeans and you might buy nike shoes and so on and so you're doing those for certain reasons and you already have some understanding of those businesses and probably that's the initial starting point is to look at things that you're familiar with you know you've got some understanding of these companies because it's a very big leap for a company to be able to get even a dollar from you I mean, for a company to get a dollar from you means that they've got some tremendous moat. Because as humans, we're going to be very careful about optimizing. And so if someone is actually able to get your interest or get you in their store or get you to buy their products, that means you might not be the only human who might have that interest. And so that might be the way to, to get going. Yeah, right here. Go ahead. Monish, thank you so much for your presentation. Wonderful. I only have a question. You know, of, of the 12 success that uh, Mr. Buffett wrote, right, only one is an individual, which is Ajit Jain. What is it so special about Ajit Jain, I mean, given your closeness to Warren or Charles Jr.? Like, he just seems to be the whale that never surfaced. But what was so special about him that you can learn from? Yeah. Ajit is a very good bookie. Yeah. If he wasn't an insurance, he'd be a great bookie. <laughs> so one time I got to hang out with two of Ajit's direct reports. It was many years back in Omaha. And I, I, I asked them this question. I said, how come you guys do so well? Like, what's going on? OK. So they said, Monish, we're going to play a game with you, which is going to explain to you. So now I'm going to open the kimono for you. It's never been opened before. <laughs> Definitely, Ajit is never going to talk about this. Okay, so they said, "Well, we're going to bring up to you certain certain deals that were presented to us, and we want you to tell us the premium that you would charge to insure this particular risk." Okay, so they said that, like for example, this is the first thing they said is that there were two Chinese satellites that were going to put up, when we sent up into orbit, each one had a cost of one billion. And they, Berkshire was approached to insure, so the insurance policy was that the satellite just gets to the right orbit distance on the Earth. Beyond that, if it works or doesn't work, is irrelevant. It just has to clear the tower and get to the right geostationary ob orbit. So they asked me, you know, so you got this two billion payout you would have if it didn't make it. What would be the premium? And I'm like saying, well, what are the odds? You know, <laughs> what are the odds? They said, yeah, you know, maybe like one in five or one in ten or something doesn't 
work, you know, maybe you can say like 10 or 15 percent might be the risk. So I said, oh, you know, maybe you can collect like 400 million. They said, we collected 800 million. And I said, did you ring the register? He said, absolutely. You know, so he said, the satellites went up, no problem. And we just sent the money to Warren to buy more Coke. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they went through a bunch of these different things with, with me. And, and what I realized when I was looking at their, the economics of what they were doing, because the thing is, like, I think one time the California Earthquake Authority came to them. And, you know, it had been like a hundred years since the 1906 earthquake. So basically, you know, San Francisco blows about every hundred years or so, or the San Andreas with a significant uh, earthquake. So they wanted a policy which would cover 8.0 and above. And uh, the California Earthquake Authority was looking for that policy for five years. So, you know, we want a five-year coverage of 8.0. And so first of all, Berkshire said, we're not going to five years. We'll, we'll give you one year or two years. And uh, it was several billion in premium. And basically the situation there was nobody else was going to write that policy. So they did some calculations. They probably charged about four times what the risk was or something. And because there's nobody else in the game and California wanted an assurance that the state has the money, they paid the premium. You know, and so what I realized when they were just writing these things, and that's why Ajit is so exceptional, is that they are able to, so Berkshire has an appetite to take on significant payouts. And because they aren't in a field where there's a lot of people who would even be trusted, because the, the person buying the policy wants to make sure the guy is around to pay you, you know, when the thing happens. And so when we finished the exercise, everything was priced at like three times what it should have been priced at. So... That's why Ajit's picture is up there. So, but, but you know, we are at a 9-11. So should we call it a day? What do you say? One more. One more, OK. Wonderful. Right here, OK. All right, well, so I consider myself a fairly well-educated person, read the Wall Street every day, but I don't have the slightest clue on which wagons to pick and circle. Therefore, I default to index investing. And if my goal in life is to secure a upper middle class retirement, would you endorse that approach? Yeah, because you've, you've circled around 500 great wagons. And, you know, for sure some of them are the Walmarts and the Costcos and so on. And that's, the indexing is a great way to go. I think you've made a very wise choice. And the more important thing is the savings rate and a healthy lifestyle, long runway, <laughs> and everything else will take care of itself. And you, uh, you will end up an extremely wealthy man. Congratulations. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.